just don't want to get it wrong a bit. No, so, so, so embarrassing. No, 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 Good. Right, good evening, everybody. I think we're just about ready to start. So if I can first welcome everybody here who's come to uh, Queen's this evening um, to listen to our lecture and also to say good evening to those who are at home on Zoom. Uh, can we just make sure that everybody please has their mobile phones uh, turned to silent or turned off? Um, and those at home, if you could also maybe just uh, turn your videos off as well. Uh, for the duration. So it's uh, my great pleasure this evening to introduce our speaker tonight, uh, Dr. Uh, Emer Megan. Emer is the lead project officer on the Strategic Archaeological Research Framework Project at the Discovery Programme. She completed her PhD in 2017 at uh, UCD in the School of Archaeology, where her research used 3D visualization techniques to explore the role of choice as a driver of social change in Neolithic islands societies. She's also a graduate of uh, Trinity College Dublin in the Classic Department with a BA in Ancient History, Archaeology and Spanish. Also the University of Glasgow Sc School of Humanities um, with an MPhil in Mediterranean Archaeology and uh, in UCD School of Art and History and Cultural Policy with an MA in Cultural Policy and Arts Management. And most recently, she completed a uh, dip in 3D computer animation at the Dundalk Institute of Technology in the School of Informatics and uh, Creative Arts. So having focused largely in the development and application of archaeological theory in her earlier postgrad work, uh, she spent the years following her doctoral research exploring how the potential of digital technologies can be harnessed in the documentation, analysis, interpretation and management of cultural heritage. In this context, she's worked on a range of digital heritage projects um, with the um, Techno Technological University of Dublin spin-out company, the Virtual Lab, including Virtual Historic Dublin and the Digital Dice Hall project. Over the last 20 years, she's also worked in commercial archaeology as well as further in higher education. So her talk this evening explores the how and to what end 3D visualization technologies have been employed by archaeologists over the past four decades. It'll take an international perspective to begin with before focusing in on the island of Ireland to consider how archaeologists have contributed to this approach so far and what that contribution might look like in the future. So Emer, thank you for coming to see us and I'll pass it over to you. Thank you very much. Um, firstly, thank you very much to Duncan and also to Anne for the invitation to come and speak to you this evening. Um, and also thank you very much to all of you for um, taking the time out of your evening to, um, to come and listen. Um, so uh, there are many different types of data visualization that can and have been employed within archaeology, but my particular area of interest and what I want to talk to you about this evening is three-dimensional computer-generated visualization. And it is an area that was at least initially, and I think to a significant degree still is founded on what's referred to as constructive solid geometry modeling um, or CSG modeling, um, which through the magical marriage of computer hardware and computer software allows for 3D graphical representation and crucially reconstruction of material cultural or archaeological evidence. And within archaeology, um, it is an approach that has had a long and I would say at times checkered history. So I want to start off um, by talking this evening a little bit about how it is that archaeologists came to apply uh, 3D visualization technologies in the first instance um, and how that application then has changed and evolved over the years. And then I want to focus in a little bit more on this particular island and talk a little bit about how archaeologists here have contributed to that approach so far. And then, as Anne said, um, what that contribution might look like in the future. Uh, firstly, though, I want to kind of set the scene a little bit and I'm going to take you back to the late 1960s and the early 1970s at a time when the power of computing was just really kind of starting to be explored within archaeology. And that was usually in relation to things like geophysics and also geographical information systems and just general statistical analyses as well. And one particularly important individual in that early movement, I would say, um, was a man called John Wilcock. 
He is a, a British computer engineer by training, but in the 60s, um, his interest in archaeology led him to start or encouraged him to start um, exploring um, how he might use computer applications uh, to benefit archaeological investigation. And that experimentation ultimately led him to um, set up the Research Centre for Computer Archaeology in um, Staffordshire University in 1973. And I should say that he remained on there as the director of that uh, centre up until 2012. Um, but also in 1973, he, along with um, others who are working in this kind of fledgling subdiscipline, they got together and they organized and ran um, the first computer applications in archaeology conference in um, Birmingham. Um, and that conference very quickly became an annual event. And today it has grown to into a, a, an, in, a, an international organization that um, supports and encourages interdisciplinary collaboration and also knowledge exchange between mathematicians, archaeologists, and of course, um, computer scientists. Um, even today, 50 years on, it's still a very important forum that brings together people working in computational archaeology and allows them to share their ideas and also generate new ideas. But that was particularly um, true um, for people like uh, John Wilcox, PhD students in the 70s and the 80s, when due to the real novelty of their work at that time, um, it was much more challenging to uh, disseminate it. And when you read through the list of kind of 20 plus PhD students that Wilcox supervised over the course of his career, it really reads like a who's who of pioneers in terms of uh, computational archaeology. And quite a few individuals on that list played an active role in one way or another in um, the development of um, 3D visualization techniques within archaeology. But there's definitely one person on that list that I think deserves to be singled out for his work in the area, and that is um, Paul Riley. And he was one of Wilcox PhD students in the early 80s. Initially, his area of interest or his focus was on GIS and how you could use GIS as a tool for archaeological landscape analysis. Um, but in the mid 80s, um, through his involvement with CAA, he encountered an individual from IBM and that individual invited him to IBM UK's Scientific Research Centre, which was based in Winchester at the time. And it was there then in 1986 that Riley collaborated with a multidisciplinary team in the creation of a 3D solid model um, that was intended to illustrate the six phases of construction of uh, Winchester's um, Anglo-Saxon Priory Cathedral, which is known as the Old Minster. Now, the Old Minster um, itself was demolished in the 11th century, um, and all that survives today is the footprint of the final phase of construction, which you can see there, um, uh, which is marked out in bricks. However, there was a program of excavation that was carried out there in the 1960s, and through that program of excavation, they got a fairly good sense of the architectural evolution uh, of the cathedral between the 7th and the 10th centuries. So Riley and his team took the, the various drawings from that excavation, the plans and the sections, and they used them in collaboration with IBM's um, experimental solid modeling um, geometry software, which was called Winsome. And they produced as a result an animated um, schematic 3D visualization, which focused on the, um, uh, the evolution of the geometric properties of the cathedral rather than its structural properties or its material properties for which there wasn't really any evidence recorded during excavation. Now, you should say that um, this model, the Old Minster model, is not thought to represent the first example of its kind. That accolade is um, thought to belong to uh, a model of the Temple of Sulis Minerva and its surrounding precinct in Bath. Um, and that was created in early 1984 by a team um, based out of the Mechanical Engineering Department in the University um, of Bath. Um, Unlike the Old Minster project, the Bath project did not use any kind of animation and instead that project um, or the output from that project uh, amounted to kind of 2D static images or renders of the model, which is probably why um, it didn't garner as much interest at the time and, and in part why um, we're not quite as familiar with it today in archaeology. Though I will say that one of the reasons or another of the reasons why the Old Minster Project has survived so well into or in archaeological consciousness is the fact that in 2015, the data from that model was rediscovered and by some sort of miracle, it was still readable 
So it was possible to reproduce that model and also reproduce the um, fly through of the final phase of uh, construction. Um, and those, the models and the fly through are available um, online. You can see that um, address there. Um, if anybody wants to write it down um, later on and you want a closer look at that slide, just let me know. Um, so you can go to that um, website and then kind of interact with and play around with, uh, with the model itself. Um, the bath model, on the other hand, the data from that, as far as we know, has not uh, survived. Um, so when this project had been completed, Paul Riley then started to think about how the technologies he had employed might be used to do more than just reconstruct monuments for illustrative purposes. And in this context, he firstly um, suggested that models like the Old Minster could maybe be used to shed light on uh, construct construction devices used in the past to um, manipulate or control the physical experience of built space. And he also suggested that the modeling process itself might be used as a tool to help archaeologists define, refine and express their ideas on the original and changing form of both um, structures and also um, artifacts. But beyond its application then within the field of um, built heritage, he also thought that solid geometry modeling was maybe capable of providing insight in terms of the analysis and interpretation of excavation data through the modeling or simulation of um, archeological formations or stratigraphies. And to showcase this, he developed a, an excavation simulation program or software, which he called Graphland. And that was designed to use site surface survey data to model um, the context layers or the various cuts and fills of an archaeological formation. The screenshots here um, show um, an example of one such modeled but hypothetical formation. Um, and you can see the layers there are differentiated um, by color. Uh, they are taken from a short Graphland animation, um, which Riley produced in 1990, and that again is still available um, through Vimeo. And again, if, if you want to, um, to, to write that uh, link down later on, um, just let me know. Um, when you watch that in, uh, animation, Riley's concept is, is illustrated by showing the cutting of what he calls or defines as arbitrary sections or plana um, through the formation. And as the, um, the animation progresses, the major layers then are revealed through that cutting. And then one of those features, and also the features contained within those layers, I should say, one of those features then towards the end of the animation is isolated. And finally, you see the cutting away again of, um, of sections or plana to reveal within that feature uh, an artifactual assemblage. And he called this simulated approach virtual archaeology. So this was the first time this term was used, and this is what it was used um, to describe. And he felt that that would allow for excavation data to be spatially analyzed in a way that hadn't been possible before. And he also felt, and I think uh, rightly so, that um, this approach would allow for um, better communication with non-specialist audiences in terms of explaining how archaeologists arrived at their interpretations of excavation data. But unfortunately, um, I think anyway, um, Riley's vision for virtual archaeology, as expressed here, has never really been realized. And Graphland didn't really have any kind of life outside of his uh, work with IBM. However, the term virtual archaeology, on the other hand, seems to have caught the imagination of others working within the field at the time. And they kind of co-opted it and used it from the early 90s, really just to describe any kind of um, 3D modeling or application of 3D modeling technologies uh, within archaeology. And at that time, that didn't really extend to anything beyond architectural reconstruction. Um, throughout the 90s, then, the nature of that reconstruction um, started to really focus in on, on photorealism. And um, people seemed to want to make uh, the more photorealistic the model, the better. Uh, and that was facilitated at the time by really an exponential and seemingly kind of um, endless improvement in computer graphics. Um, the preoccupation that we see at that stage with photorealism can probably best be understood in terms of um, what is sometimes referred to as the persuasiveness uh, of images. So the more real something looks, 
the more persuasive it is. And within a kind of um, the context of archaeological visualization, that's a very comforting prospect um, in that a photorealistic model um, just seems to, by its very appearance, offer evidence of the, the credibility or the reliability of the interpretation uh, that it presents. Um, by the mid 1990s, though, mid to late 1990s, concerns were being expressed about this trend um, in photorealism. And Nick Ryan, who was another of John Wilcox's PhD students from Staffordshire, he warned against um, uh, what he described as the inappropriate and misguided uh, pursuit of realism, because he felt that the inevitable consequence of this would be the promotion of so-called virtual archaeology simply as a means of presenting and disseminating the results uh, of archaeological inquiry rather than as a set of tools or uh, techniques uh, that might, as Riley had initially intended, support the archaeological process and the interpretation uh, of those results. In and around the same time as well, um, Mark Gillings also argued that this notion of virtual archaeology, um, as it was understood at the time, um, uh, as just facilitating the creation of um, ingenious end products and nothing else, that that needed to be challenged if the field was going to survive um, and thrive. And another related problem also highlighted at the time um, was uh, one of um, quality assurance. And um, uh, the fact that it was often very difficult when you looked at a 3D visualization of an archaeological site at the time to determine what part of that model is based on evidence and what part is creative license. And that particular issue is probably um, well illustrated by these two slides. Um, the lower slide there uh, is a visualization of a site and the upper site or the upper image is um, the reality of the evidence that was used to inform that visualization. And that particular problem then was made all the more challenging um, or exacerbated by the fact that the uh, television and video games industry really embraced 3D models of archaeological sites very early on. But the, the level or the nature of archaeological input, if any, in the models that they were using was often really impossible um, to say. So. In the kind of mid 90s, there were quite a few issues that were kind of getting in the way or ham hampering the, uh, the, the development of, of the field. And so in an attempt to kind of tackle those issues um, and to try and resolve the general lack of clarity that was surrounding visualization, it was suggested that a professional organization um, be formed with the express aim of establishing standards, rules, um, and also conventions in relation to the documentation of the creation of um, visualization projects. So in other words, what was really being called for at that stage was a, a system of authentication. And in the early 2000s, there was um, a, a short-lived attempt at doing just that and providing that kind of system. And that was made by the Cultural Virtual Reality Organization. But as I said, it was short-lived and it, it didn't come to much. In 2009, though, a second attempt was made and that was much more uh, successful and it resulted in the publication of the London Charter for the Computer-Based Visualization of yeah. Cultural Heritage, which um, is a document that contains six guiding principles that are intended um, to ensure intellectual integrity, reliability, documentation, sustainability, and also accessibility within the field of um, digital heritage. Later on then, and building on that London Charter, um, and tailored specifically in this case to archaeological visualization, the principles of or um, of Seville, or sorry, the the um, the international uh, charter um, of virtual archaeology from from Seville was published in 2014, and in this case, it set out eight principles, which aimed, among other things, at um, fostering the use of new technologies in such a way that it would drive archaeological research and conservation. Um, and certainly it's, it's definitely fair to say that since the publication of these charters, visualization projects in archaeology have definitely become more transfer transparent and also more um, accessible uh, in general. Uh, and as well as that, when it comes to research, 
um, Paul Riley's vision for virtual archaeology as um, an interpretive tool that might be used to engage with the archaeological process. Um, that has come a little bit closer um, to being realised. Uh, that is not so much due, though, I should say, to the use of solid geometry modelling as he had envisaged in 1990, but it's more so due to um, the use of 3D scanning and photogrammetry um, technologies, which have increasingly been um, employed over the last two decades to document the excavation process itself, um, allowing archaeologists to record um, their deposits on site uh, firstly, in um, 3D point cloud form and then subsequently in mesh model form um, before and as they're removing those deposits. Um, just to clarify before I move on, a mesh model, unlike a solid model, um, doesn't have mass or volumetric properties, but it does allow you to represent kind of better um, less angular and more organic shaped objects, which obviously is useful in, in an archaeological context, not just for kind of structures and also um, artifacts, but also if you want to represent um, field deposits, which are by their nature, obviously kind of generally undulating uh, and more organic. Um, the most sophisticated, I would say, uh, example of this kind of 3D digging approach, as it's sometimes referred to, uh, can be seen in um, the work of Maurizio Forte and his team um, at a Neolithic house known as Building 89 in Shatelhuyuk in central Turkey. Um, and there the team captured, processed and visualized a whole range of 3D data types on site. And that included using immersive virtual reality technologies all while the excavation um, was going on. And this particular approach allowed the team there uh, to analyze the individual deposits that they were um, removing and the overall stratigraphy of um, the house from two perspectives uh, in such a way that they were able to integrate um, what are usually two distinct excavation and post-excavation phases of interpretation. And so that allowed that team to kind of uh, bet, get a better sense of um, the relationship between um, contexts literally as they were um, removing them. It gave them just that little bit of distance maybe, um, uh, but that distance was kind of crucially kind of achieved while they were on site in the thick of um, interpretation. And to illustrate that process, you can see um, there on the left, um, the image shows the various um, color-coded stratigraphic layers within Building 89 and their relationship to each other, um, which is then expressed using the same color coding then in um, the associated Harris matrix on the far left of that image. The image on the right, um, that shows the use of a telemersive um, system, uh, which allowed for the creation of uh, an immersive virtual space in which different 3D data types, whether it be from scanning or photogrammetry or GIS, um, could be visualized in real time um, and explored by project participants, both optically and to a degree haptically, um, through the use of a Nintendo Wii remote and also 3D glasses. Um, so if you were one of the users and you had the glasses on and the remote, um, to give you an example, if you moved your head, you, the view, your view was updated in real time. Um, crucially, with that environment um, and its virtual nature, it allowed for people who were not able to come to site, specialists who were not able to come to site, to um, go online and to um, kind of uh, interact with those deposits um, at the same time as each other and at the same time as others who were on the site. So it really fostered a, a really um, kind of collaborative uh, approach to interpretation and it was really successful. Um, that all sounds amazing and, and very encouraging in terms of making 3D technologies work for us in a more uh, rewarding and research oriented way. But as I'm sure you can imagine, um, processing and visualizing 3D data on an archeological site is quite expensive. And it also requires the input of quite a few specialists. And that's not realistically achievable um, on your average kind of everyday um, archaeological site. Um, that said, 
we have um, had uh, some, or we've seen some great improvements in the last number of years in terms of um, the affordability of, of good camera technology, and also in terms of accessibility of um, photogrammetric software. And that has really paid dividends um, in, uh, in archeology span with an increasing number of excavations recorded in that way to allow for more in-depth analysis um, of data as part of the post-ex um, analysis process. And also I would say it has allowed for a kind of better presentation of the evidence um, in dissemination. Um, one excavation uh, which um, has used, or one recent excavation, which has used photogrammetry extensively to record both um, built or in situ and displaced structural remains, as well as uh, stratigraphic information is that of um, Douth Hall Neolithic Passage Tomb in County Meath, which uh, some of you may be familiar with. And the director of that particular project, uh, Clina Nilonon, um, she had had experience um, using photogrammetry to document rock art as part of her PhD. So she decided then to kind of um, integrate that experience in her, um, in her process at Douth Hall. And she initially used um, a digital SLR camera in conjunction with free open source software and paid proprietorial software. And that all allowed her to um, capture, process and visualize um, her data and ultimately produce mesh models of that data. Um, but in the last kind of year or so, uh, she has kind of switched tack a little bit and she's now using her phone uh, and a free app called Curry Engine which allows her to capture and process the data. And then she brings that data into the free open source software to kind of clean it up and prepare it um, for presentation. So in that aerial image there, you can see marked by the two red circles, that is a sondage where some of the site's most complex stratigraphies have been uncovered. And I'm gonna show you now two mesh models that she's created using Curie Engine from that area that shows the excavation um, uh, unfolding at different stages. Um, so the first one, oh, that kind of gives you a sense, sorry, of the, the photogrammetric process there and the overlapping of um, photographs to create a 3D model, which is what she did. Um, uh, initially with um, her camera uh, or a DSLR and then later with her phone. Um, so here we have uh, the two mesh models that I mentioned. The first one you can see there, it shows a stone deposit overlying what is a large flake of grey wacky. Um, and then the next model then uh, shows uh, where that layer of stone has been removed and that grey wacky flake then has been um, exposed. And I think these two models give you a really good sense of what can be achieved currently um, using very readily available and very affordable um, technology. Um, though I would say that training and experience are factors that need to be considered um, in this um, area. And that's a subject that I want to come back to a little bit later on. But before I do that, I think it's probably worth acknowledging at this point that the Douth Hall project is the first example of 3D visualization that I have uh, mentioned in the context of archaeological practice on this island. And um, the reason for that is uh, because in terms of virtual archaeology, as it was practiced in the 90s and into the, the 2000s, with such a heavy emphasis on um, solid geometry modeling, we didn't really contribute very much, if at all. And it was only really in um, the kind of early to mid 2000s onwards when laser scanning and photogrammetry started to be used much more frequently um, within archaeology that we started to produce uh, mesh models rather than solid geometry models um, uh, on the island. Um, and I think it is um, very fair to say that my two uh, colleagues in the Discovery Programme, Anthony Corns and uh, Rob Shaw, have um, together with national and international partners really led the use of photogrammetry and, and laser scanning within archaeology on the island. And um, until recently, or relatively recently, I would say, laser scanning um, was the more powerful of those two uh, techniques. And over the years, they've used both terrestrial and aerial laser scanning to document um, a range of uh, landscapes, such as the Tara landscape, which is shown here, as well as a range of both um, prehistoric and historic buildings, including the um, Neolithic passage tombs of the Boyne Valley, um, and also um, kind of more recent 
um, monuments or buildings, including Leinster House in Dublin, which of course is, is Georgian in terms of its uh, style of architecture. Um, on a smaller scale than this, uh, they have also documented a range of objects using handheld scanning technologies. And um, they include the so-called um, Prince of Glauberg, which is a fifth century um, BC um, Latin style sandstone statue uh, that seems to depict an armed male warrior. And this was found in a burial mound um, at an Iron Age hill fort settlement in Hesse in Germany. And the data captured as part of that scanning exercise, which you can see there in action um, on the left, that eventually um, found its way to a German uh, visual artist called Ottmar Horl. And he used it to create 3D printed versions um, of that prince, uh, which were then displayed en masse uh, as a part as part of an installation, which you can see exhibited here uh, behind the artist. And very recently, um, one of these princes was gifted to the Discovery Programme by the Museum at Glauberg. So one of these guys um, has taken up permanent residence uh, in our office. Um, as I mentioned earlier, more recent developments in photogrammetry and photogram photogrammetric technologies have made that particular approach um, much more powerful and so much more uh, attractive. And in the last number of years in particular, Anthony and Rob have also been using photogrammetry then um, to, uh, to work with um, or to document um, uh, objects more frequently. And that includes um, this cross lab, which is from um, Fahan. And you can see here in this image, there is a photorealistic texture applied um, to that mesh model. Um, but if I um, uh, come, go on in the slides, you can see that once that photogrammetric um, texture is disabled or removed, underneath it, you see a geometric texture and you can see a lot more um, detail, detail that's no longer visible to the naked eye, either on the uh, photorealistic texture um, or on um, the real thing. Um, and the same can be said then for um, this uh, high cross from a Henny. And you can see the photorealistic texture on the left there um, and the geometric texture on the right and, and lo a lot more definition there uh, on the right. So mesh models like these can be really um, revealing research tools as well as serving to document the condition of an object or a structure at a particular time. And they can also be used, um, much as Paul Riley had suggested, uh, solid models can be used to shed light on processes of construction and production in the past. And that's exactly what has happened with um, the model of the mace head from Knight. Um, uh, this, I should say, was also produced um, using photogrammetry, and the data from it then was used to create 3D printouts of the model, like the Prince of Glauberg. And one of those 3D prints then um, was used or is being used to inform a, a project that's been run by Joe Fennick in the University of Galway, um, which is uh, using an uh, experimental or an experimental approach which draws from traditional glass cutting techniques to try and reverse engineer uh, the mace head and kind of shed light on how exactly um, it was created. Uh, the development of um, drone or UAV photography, uh, as it's known, has also meant that photogrammetry um, can now easily be used um, to document more than just objects, but also um, buildings and even landscapes, uh, including the one um, shown here, which is at Dune Beg in, in County Kerry. And you can see there in that image on the left, there is a 19th century um, map of uh, that shows the fort and also the coastline there, uh, which is shown in green. And then you have in the middle two mesh models that were produced in 2017 and 2018, respectively. And um, you can see that they're showing the changing um, uh, location uh, of the coast. Um, so um, they have allowed for erosion and land loss to the west of the fort to be quantified, uh, which of course is, is hugely um, useful. And I should say that these models were produced as part of Cherish, which was a six year EU funded project um, that finished up uh, recently, um, earlier on this year. And the overall aim of that project was to raise awareness and understanding of the impact of climate change, increased storminess, and also um, extreme weather events. 
um, on both the maritime and coastal heritage of um, or cultural heritage of parts of Ireland and also um, parts of Wales. Uh, combining scanning and photogrammetry, particularly where larger objects uh, um, or monuments are concerned, um, has also proven to be very rewarding uh, when it comes to the production of more robust and versatile data. Um, and this can be seen here in the model of Strayed Abbey in County Mayo. Um, here, terrestrial laser scanning was used in conjunction with terrestrial photogrammetry and also um, UAV or drone photogrammetry. Um, and that combination um, led to uh, the production of a really uh, a model with really high level um, geometric accuracy. And that level of accuracy has then allowed for um, orthographic sections to be um, uh, drawn across the model, such as this one. And those kind of sections then can be very useful in terms of um, identifying kind of structural or architectural uh, issues um, and then maybe support potential conservation issues or conservation inter interventions that might be needed uh, in the future. Um, when it comes to informing conservation though, especially conservation of the structural variety, the most useful type of model to use is the solid model, because as I mentioned earlier, sol solid models give you access to um, volumetric and, and mass properties. However, until um, relatively recently, creating solid models required uh, a lot more manual modeling or manual effort, and that made it um, uh, more um, time consuming and more costly um, to model solid models rather than mesh models where the camera or the scanner and the um, processing software do a bit of the work for you and so take a bit of the pressure um, off the modeler. Ideally, then, what you want is to be able to take your um, scan data or your photogrammetry data and to use that to automatically generate uh, a solid model. Uh, and in recent years, machine learning and advances in machine le learning have really um, advanced that aim. And that's exactly the method that was used in the case of the four courts in, in Dublin and the column capitals for the four courts there. Many of those column capitals are in uh, kind of varied states of repair, and there are um, some even that need to be replaced. Um, so uh, in the last um, number of years, the OPW, the Office of Public Works, engaged the, OP, uh, the discovery program to generate mesh models of each of those um, capitals. Firstly, to kind of assess the situation and see what kind of state each one was in. Um, and then machine learning was used to take the mesh model and uh, to convert that to a solid model of an intact column um, that, or capital that um, then was used um, much like in product design, to uh, inform the cutting um, of a new replacement column uh, that was then finished off or could be finished off by hand. So there you can see on the left that solid model that's generated through machine learning. And on the right hand side, then um, one of the, um, the columns that was cut using um, that solid model um, as a template. The use of machine learning, though, as I'm sure you can appreciate, um, really kicks a project up, though, in terms of um, the skill set that you need on the project. Um, and it's just, it's not, again, realistic to be integrating machine learning in a lot of kind of everyday or smaller projects. Um, so there have been um, kind of attempts at uh, made to automate the conversion of scan data uh, to solid geometry using more accessible off the shelf um, software. This has largely been done in the context of um, uh, buildings or using structural data in conjunction with what is called building information modeling uh, or BIM software. And that software um, was designed as a tool uh, for the digital representation of the um, changing physical and functional attributes of a building um, during the course of its lifetime. So that kind of software allows you to um, or allows for the identification of attributes within your model and the subsequent then embedding of um, and regular updating of a range of information related to that structure that you're modeling. So things like what materials were used uh, in the building of, of, of that structure. 
historic BIM um, or uh, HBIM as it's um, also known, that represents a, a modification or a tailoring of the BIM approach. Um, and it was devised to accommodate the management of uh, historic architecture, uh, specifically in order to make, um, make it easier for um, the often very complex conservation issues that characterize the maintenance um, of those kind of historic structures to be identified, uh, monitored, um, and, um, and also addressed through coordinated conservation interventions. Where modern architecture with its nice straight lines and its kind of formulaic rules is concerned, automating that process from scan to BIM model is challenging enough. Um, and then uh, those challenges then pale in comparison when you're talking about um, automating the process uh, in archaeological terms, because obviously most of the structures that we're dealing with in archaeology um, do not have nice straight lines and are not based on kind of formulaic uh, rules of architecture. Um, so the road um, of, of getting from scan to BIM in archaeology has been a lot more challenging. Um, and the particularly high level of irregularity, for example, in megalithic um, architecture does not lend itself at all well um, to, uh, to kind of rule based definitions. So kind of inspired by that um, and in an attempt to kind of begin to address that, uh, I led a, a short project last summer in partnership with Jessica Mendoza, who is a, a, an architecture master's in the uh, SIMS or um, uh, Carlton Immersive Media Studio Lab at Carlton University in uh, Ottawa. And that project was aimed at um, developing an accessible and effective way of converting scan data from non-uniform structures to native BIM geometry, which native BIM geometry is much, much easier to work with in BIM than um, mesh or scan data. As part of that project, we used sample data that we had captured at Douth Hall using a, an iPad Pro LiDAR scanner. Um, so very lightweight, more accessible. Um, the data wouldn't be as good now as um, a, a terrestrial laser scanner or more high-tech uh, approach, um, but it did what we needed um, as a case study. And uh, the prototype that prototype that was created, which you can see here, um, we were very much encouraged with, with those results. Uh, and so going forward with that project, the plan for us is to build an entire BIM of all of the displaced and uh, in situ remains um, at Douth Hall um, so that we can, we can use that BIM then to do things like um, explore reconstruction scenarios. Now we've, we've tried very tentatively so far, kind of playing around with reconstruction scenarios and have moved fallen or displaced stones into positions and played around with them. Um, but uh, really we need the entire BIM to, to really kind of give that uh, a good go. Um, and crucially, when we have that complete BIM, that will allow us to embed and update information related to the condition of those stones, which are now exposed and have been exposed for, um, for a couple of years. And so, if conservation issues um, uh, arise, we can be kind of ahead of the curve um, with that. And even further down the line then, the hope is that um, the BIM model ultimately can be brought into a, um, a games engine environment, uh, which would allow then for uh, uh, the creation of a virtual world um, where specialist and non-specialist audiences could kind of navigate the model and interact with it and could um, essentially kind of weave their own multi-perspectival um, but crucially evidence-based narratives um, about uh, the, the tomb and about the site in general. Uh, so um, just to kind of wind up then and, and uh, finish off, I want to just come back um, to the issue or the subject of education and, and training, um, which I touched on very briefly earlier. Um, and just to give you kind of a bit of context for this, when I started um, 3D modeling in and around 2009 and 2010, I found it just like absolutely impossible to get suitable um, training or education. Um, and I'm, I'm sad to say that I think I would likely find myself in the same position today if I set out on the same mission. Um, now, Paul Riley and a couple of others who were involved in the modeling of that old Minster um, uh, model in, in um, 1986, 
they have uh, kind of referred to what they described as the echelons of tech savvy archaeologists and digital cultural experts that exist today in comparison to the kind of very few that existed when they started out in the early 80s. And they've also drawn attention to um, several postgraduate courses offered on virtual pasts and also um, uh, uh, virtual archaeology, as well as kind of more general postgrads on digital heritage. And certainly it's, it's definitely true that the number of people working in the field has grown exponentially. Um, but I would say that um, much of their education and training, especially with kind of younger practitioners, um, is still self-directed. Um, and I think this will only become more and more prevalent uh, over time um, because um, lots of the, uh, the earlier labs, like uh, John Wilcox lab in Winchester um, uh, and also Southampton University's archaeological computing lab um, have kind of um, closed, or at least the Southampton one, for all intents and purposes, appears to have, have ceased operations. And in addition to those closures of, of labs, which are designed to provide that formal training, um, the postgrad in um, digital pasts that was name checked by Riley and, and friends um, and which was offered at Southampton University, that's also been discontinued, as has a humanities or a digital humanities masters in um, Maynooth University. So it really seems to me that we have kind of um, backslid a little bit in this area. And I think um, if we are to fully realize um, what um, 3D visualization can do in archaeology in terms of uh, research and in terms of conservation uh, and also engaging and involving the wider public. We really need to focus, I think, on accessibility. And that's not just accessibility of kind of hardware and software uh, and accessibility of outputs of the models themselves, but um, I think crucially it's accessibility of training um, as well going forward. So um, I am going to finish off uh, on that note. Um, and I just wanted to say again, thank you very much for taking um, your time out uh, or the time out of your evening uh, to listen to me. And thank you again to, to Duncan and Anne. Um, and I should say before, one thing before I finish, um, all of the discovery program models that um, I've shown you this evening, they are available to uh, view and also to interact with um, on our um, Sketchfab page. So if you want to um, have a, a play around with those, um, that is where to go. Um, so thank you very much. Much indeed uh, for an extraordinary um, insight into um, the developments that have gone on. It's quite extraordinary um, just how far mm. um, this technology yeah. has come, yeah. you know, in the last number of years and I just hope that you know enough people will mm. will carry it on because it's come so far you know it is a shame to think that it could backslide a little yeah. bit now yeah um so uh would anybody like to ask him or any questions anybody in the room or um anybody at home if you want to either unmute yourself raise your hand or else um <coughs> if you want to uh, put it in chat. Um, I'm sure Duncan can see if there any questions there. So, anybody got anything? Rushing? Has any of these technologies been used at the Ness of Brodgar? Um, excavation. Um, I don't know the ins and outs of the um, the Brodgar excavations. Um, uh, I'm not even. I'm well. The Glasgow Art School is one of the few places that is still going strong with formal education um, and they have a, a, a visualize or visualization masters specifically kind of tailored to cultural heritage so um i would probably be surprised if they haven't uh, in can I just cut in? Uh, yes i have um, i did that in 15 to 2019 there you go i did all the photo it's all on sketchfab right. um, oh, okay. forward slash nessabrogga and you can see all the 3d models and everything there so right. yeah the photogrammetry okay. side of it has been done and, and me busy tomorrow <laughs> <laughs> could, I, could I just ask how can you future proof 
this te technology um, because you know as you even mentioned even yeah. with Paul Riley's yeah that it was even a struggle to yeah it was to, just to, quite to kind of yeah by some chance. of his um that uh, yeah so that is an issue um but there's a, a real movement um, in the last number of years, or probably the, the last decade or more, uh, to make your data fair, which means it should be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Um, and mm -hmm. as part of that, um, there are there is a, a significant community of people who are looking at data management um, and archiving standards. Um, and uh, so there's a lot of kind of effort going in there. I would say probably um, more so, or they're further along, um, certainly in Britain, um, uh, than, uh, than we would be um, kind of uh, on this island, uh, absolutely. Um, but it's, it's certainly something that is a, a focus for people and there is a lot of work being done on it. Uh, so they're very much conscious of it. And Anthony um, in the Discovery Programme in particular um, is somebody who kind of leads uh, the charge within the Discovery Programme in terms of future people our data so it's just a matter I think of um, kind of setting up kind of uh, standards and um, uh, approaching your data capture um, with a, a data management and data capture plan and um, so that obviously will, will help a lot in the future making sure that that data um, will still be accessible. Great. Anybody else? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry Pat yes. <coughs> Excuse me Emma. Um, you mentioned some free software that can be used yes. with iPhones. Yes. Um, um, did you say it was Curry? Curry Engine, K I R I. K I R I. Yes. Yeah. That's a pretty popular one. Now, there's loads of, of different options there to try out, but Curry Engine is, is one that seems to be particularly uh, useful um, or, and, and very popular. So, probably the best one to start with, anyway. Okay. Any uh, online? Not me. Last chance. Quick one. Have you? Um, I know there, there was some talk at the CAA a few years ago um, about this. I'm quite curious to know if you've encountered any more work um, done with haptic feedback devices while using the, you know, looking at the artifacts and things like yes. that. Yes. Um, How that's coming on. Yeah. Right? Uh, I have not recently I've seen some um, pretty cool um, stuff again uh, using the gloves and I know that people in um, Georgia Tech so Janet Murray um, has been leading stuff in Georgia Tech there um, but a lot of that is kind of uh, maybe kind of uh, cultural heritage adjacent because I know her area is more um, literature um, but I know that that's a, a center for that particular approach and they teach that um, there um, other stuff, I'm not so sure. I certainly haven't encountered it. Yeah, it seems to have died yeah. down. Doesn't it? It yeah. Seems, doesn't it? yeah, yeah. But I think that's the case with a, with a lot of this technology. We all thought 40 years ago, in 10 years time, we're going to be able to do all of this. And actually it's taken much, much longer. And I think it's because you do need a kind of, um, uh, you can do so much on your own and in ways kind of self-directed learning is really useful because you always think that if you have a problem, you have that problem because you just don't know any better. And there must be some way, um, if you were better educated, you'd know how to fix that problem. So you kind of blindly go into things and just have a stab at it. And very often it works out for you. Um, but I do think that uh, the formal education saves can save a lot of time. Uh, and uh, I think if we were to kind of focus on that a bit more, that that would pay huge dividends um, in kind of the fairly near future. Um, and we'd have kind of more of an army of equipped people. Um, so we'd be getting to destinations much more quickly as well. Yeah, not a question as such, but uh, at the training excavation this year, it's John Millis, uh, Queens, we used uh, photogrammetry and LIDAR to record the trench as we went along. Yeah. It's a useful tool. Yeah, it is absolutely because it just means, um, uh, and I know there's a lot of talk about it, um, in term in excavation terms, um, and the the kind of uh, fear that it will, among some people, that it will replace traditional drawing skills, for example. And um, but I think it's a matter of realizing what what needs to be drawn and engaged within that way on a site, and what would actually be better recorded. Um, in a more objective way that would allow you to go back and um, 
and kind of interact with uh, the data or kind of take a few looks at something before you interpret it. Um, so uh, I think it, it definitely is very useful, um, particularly in, in, in post-excavation. And I think that eventually we'll, again, start to see the return on that um, coming out uh, in a number of years. It's definitely becoming much more widespread. Um, uh, we were kind of maybe late enough to the party um, with that one. Um, as, as usual, and especially in Italy, it, it was used a lot, um, you know, 20 years ago on excavations. But, um, but again, they've, they've, they've really invested in it and it's a real focus in, um, in universities over there. Um, but I think we'll start to see kind of results coming out from it um, in, in, in archaeology here in the next while. Anyone else? Great. I'll just say thank you again very much um, on behalf of us all. Just a little. Oh, thank little you very much. Looking for you <laughs> to say thank you very much for for coming. Thanks for having us. me. Thanks for and, having me. Uh, we look forward to seeing how things go in the future. Say so it's it's certainly very exciting. Uh, a real good way, of, as you say, of visualizing yeah. the, the past without yeah. um, over restoring. Uh, yeah. Rather than just conserving things. Yes. Yeah. So. Uh, really is certainly I think especially young people today are so used to mm. um you know all sorts of uh, yeah. visualization and they speak and the language and so on. they do yeah uh, in a way that probably most of us don't mm. understand too well but uh you can certainly see the advantages of being able to um they visualize how, how buildings or artifacts must have, have looked so thank you very much indeed thank you and uh thank you And uh, can I just mention that we have uh, another lecture this month from the County Fifth, uh, Tom McNeil, will be talking to us on some aspects of uh, medieval tantrum. So hopefully we can see you all there, as many as possible in person. Uh, uh, we have uh, two coffee before that lecture at seven o'clock. So um, come along and uh, have a chat and uh, see you then. Thanks very much. Thanks. I'll come out of that for you. Yeah, I'll just I'll just close it down. Um, and